So, so ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, thank you for coming. And I'd like to start the session very soon because uh, time is limited in Davos. And uh, I'm very happy that we talk about Europe. And when we think about Europe, our continent, one has the impression Europe had a very long downhill roller coaster ride in the recent years. If we just think of the Euro crisis, we think about the Russian aggression towards Ukraine, if we think about the refugee and migrant problems which occurred. So there are a lot of topics, and we also have to mention populism and nationalism. So, but now for the moment, we have this feeling, and maybe it seems like it's going on this roller coaster uphill again. But we don't know yet where we will land. And this is something we will discuss now in the next hour. And um, I'm very happy to introduce the panel. With us is Mark Rutte. He's the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Timothy Snyder, historian and author. Cecilia Malmström, she's commissioner in Brussels for the EU. The Prime Minister of Ireland, Leo Vardakar and Mr. Costa, Prime Minister of Portugal. So I would like to tell you that there is the possibility to follow all this also on Twitter. There's a hashtag. It's Renew Europe. So if you want to go there, please don't hesitate. And if you have a question which you want to ask, you can also put this on Twitter. And if we have time, can't promise it, we also give you the chance to have this asked here. And afterwards, if we have the time, we also have the possibility of two or three questions out of the auditorium. So let us start with one question. Prime Minister Rutte, do you still believe in an ever closer union? No, I, I've never believed uh, in an ever closer union. I believe in a European Union, which is basically providing two things. First of all, by working together, by pooling together um, and being embedded in the European structure, uh, we create a collective sense uh, of safety and security, which is crucial in a very unstable world. And people do understand this, uh, that we cannot survive on our own, but that we have to pool together. And secondly, by working on very pragmatic things like the internal market, free trade agreements, uh, defending our outer borders and dealing with migration, that we collectively work on those issues which, as individual nation states, we cannot do. But I don't believe in the European Union as a sort of unavoidable uh, end state in 10, 20 or 30 years' time. Uh, I think it is a very pragmatic project um, which is crucial for the member states and which is under threat in two ways at the moment. First of all, because of Brexit, which is bad news for the UK, but also bad news for the European Union, because it is the UK who is the loudest voice for liberal free trade agreements, uh, the internal market, and to drive all of that. And by them leaving, we will lose the biggest voice on this. And we already sense this with the Mercosur uh, free trade agreement and the difficulty we have in closing that. Uh, and secondly, we have an issue, I think, uh, with the fact that so many people are talking about risk sharing and transfer unions. I don't like that. I believe that we should all do what is necessary at a national level uh, to get our economies going and then to deliver on the basic promise of the euro, which was that collectively, by each of doing, us doing what is necessary, by collectively uh, being more successful. And at the moment, we are not delivering there. So, Antonio, so what about the ever closer union? Is it dead, also in your view? And uh, Mark said that transfer union is not something which is on his mind. What do you think about it? Bien, allow me to answer in French. Bien sûr. Okay. Bien, je, je crois dans une... I think that in a, a union we need to, to take into account the needs of our citizens and the priority for the time being in the case is uh, to increase uh, confidence of citizens in the European Union, which means uh, that it's important that citizens understand that value added of the European Union is needed in order to be able to meet the major challenges uh, which exist today. For instance, 
immigration, terrorism, globalization. And I think that what I believe in all these areas, it is impossible to do better than the European Union. You know, you can't have everybody just doing things for themselves. I think it's only together in the European Union that we will have the strength in order to impose uh, the implementation on uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change, and that we can have a trade policy which uh, doesn't close our borders, but which ensures the protection of a social protection model with a high level of environmental environmental, social protection, food security as well, and which also allows us to, to be more competitive on uh, international markets, and also to have uh, more cohesion in our societies. So I think that what we need to do is to have uh, a union which is capable of providing answers to all these questions. I think people are frightened of terrorism, of course, but uh, is the question to be answered by saying closing uh, our borders? Uh, we need to have uh, cooperation between our legal authorities. I think that there are always uh, questions of risk, but the right answer to those risks is uh, to uh, really have a defense uh, security uh, a defense and security policy, and I think that the European Union provides us with that added value, and that's also why we ought to strengthen the European Union, I believe. I also don't uh, believe in a single uh, union. I think that if we want to strengthen the European Union, you need to have a solid basis, and if uh, you want to achieve that, you need to consolidate uh, what we have. And we've got to, to really have a project, uh, the most ambitious project which we've established, uh, which is the euro. And to have uh, stability for uh, the euro, we need to strengthen convergence. In order to achieve that, we need to have rules, we need to have discipline, but we also have to have uh, the resources uh, to ensure that uh, countries can catch up and that economic and social catching up will take a place which is uh, the uh, pillar for the stability of the Eurozone. It doesn't have to be a transfer union, but uh, we need to have a budgetary capacity which uh, is based on uh, the uh, system in the European Union where financing exists uh, not to finance waste or to uh, finance public expenditure, but to ensure that we can finance uh, structural expenditure which is recommended uh, by the European Union itself. So it's not a permanent transfer we're talking about, but it's a question of ensuring financing with a very uh, clear objective, quantifiable objectives with uh, specific uh, deadlines to achieve uh, conversion. Also to the proposals of, uh, of President Macron and, and what they mean for these uh, questions, but Leo, what is your country is quite affected by the discussion about Brexit and what kind of Europe is it going to be. So what do you wish what kind of Europe should come out after this hopefully going uphill again? Yeah, well, as you say, Ireland is, um, I say, the only country that is more affected by Brexit than Ireland is, is the United Kingdom itself, of course. Um, and it's uh, not our policy, but we have to deal with the rea reality of it. But no matter what happens, Ireland's place is at the heart of Europe, at the common European home, which we helped to build. And we're founder members of the euro, founder members of the single market, and we want to be um, at the heart of all future, or at least almost all future European developments. I think in many ways when you spoke about the ever closer union, uh, that's very much the language of the Treaty of Rome. Uh, and even then was aspirational. I don't think anyone ever believed that we would bring unity in Europe to the extent that we all became uh, the one country or ceased to be nation states. I don't think anybody ever really envisaged that. Um, but there are lots of areas that we can uh, deepen integration. Um, Mark's already mentioned uh, realizing more benefits from the single market. We've all signed up to uh, greater cooperation in defense through PESCO recently, uh, and there are many more things um, uh, that we can do. And actually, I find the debate about a transfer union quite interesting because in many ways, we've already always had a certain element of a transfer union uh, within Europe, uh, largely around structural funds. And for most of the period of my country's membership of the European Union, uh, we were a net beneficiary and we used structural funds to build our infrastructure. 
and by building our infrastructure, we were able to unleash the economic potential of our country. Uh, and now that we're net contributors, we don't want to pull back from that. We want to say to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, we want to invest in your countries too. Uh, and help you to unlock your economic potential because that will actually make us better off as well. So we have elements of a transfer union already uh, and one I think that we could develop further uh, is the whole idea of, of a banking union guaranteeing people savings and deposits uh, across Europe uh, and reducing the risk for individual nation states. Uh, but if we enter into that, we absolutely need to uh, be careful and be precautionary. Uh, that every country is up to standard in terms of its financial regulation uh, and the health of its banks. And I come from a country that knows a little bit about that. I remember. Uh, having put it right, um, we want to make sure that's the case across Europe. Good. Cecilia, you're responsible at the European Commission for Trade. And uh, what is, in your view, is, is there the more to the European Union than a free trade zone, I suppose? But where are you want the European Union to go and you get as a commissioner a lot of critics out of the member states. So are you always the, the wrong person to blame uh, in this European discussion? Or is it unjust to blame the Commission? What do you think of the role of the Commission and what shall be the path into new Europe? <laughs> It's partly uh, part of our paycheck to be uh, criticized by member states. Uh, so that goes with the job. But I actually feel that we have very good cooperation with member states. Sometimes we disagree, but that, that's how it is. But, but I feel a strong support in, in the, the general uh, issues. And as has been said by several of the, the prime ministers, now what we need to do is to focus on European common projects. Defense has been mentioned, a few other things as well, digital Europe, uh, fighting inequality, security, uh, migration issues. Trade is such an issue. We cannot do trade 28 countries or 27 countries alone, but we can do. And now we see also that there's a space in Europe to do uh, trade because many countries are puzzled a little bit about the lack of leadership from the United States. They are disengaging from the global scene. That leaves place open for the European Union to show that we can do good trade agreements. They can be sustainable, transparent, mutual beneficial. We can promote European values through that and we can create alliances, friendship with a circle of countries across the globe with Japan, with Canada, with the Mercosur countries, with Mexico, with Australia, New Zealand, Chile, etc. Building on this circle of friends to stand up also for multilateralism. And there Europe has a very strong role uh, today and I think we, we can do it. This is one area, not the only one area, where we can do, and it will also contribute to, to uh, consolidating the growth and job creation in the European Union. So, um, but we have a very good cooperation. I think it's better now than it was a year ago on, when it came come to trade. Then, of course, we have disagreements. Countries have different priorities, but overall, I, I, I feel that there is a good cooperation. Timothy, when you listen to this and you look as an historian to this uh, Europe, which we see now, and What could be the best outcome of the next discussions about Europe? And what can a united Europe be? And what it, does it look like? And because when you see all the, from Habsburg to, to, um, uh, to, to whatever um, happened in Rome in the 50s and, and all attempts to reunite Europe, um, and now there is hope for another one, which, which maybe is more solid Uh, towards nationalism and populism than it has been before. What, what is your view of Europe now? Right, so since you mentioned the Habsburgs, I will, I will go all the way back to 1918, because in, in all sincerity, when I think about the achievements or the, the profundity, the profound character, the achievements of the European Union, um, I, I tend to think that even today's Europeans don't see them. From a historical point of view, what the European Union is is the solution to the great European problem, which is the end of imperialism. The, century, the 20th century in Europe is the century of the end of empire. This begins with the First World War when the Habsburgs, the Ottomans, the Romanovs, and the German Empire falls apart. It continues in the Second World War when the German attempt to establish an empire inside Europe itself fails. And the project of European unity is, before all things, a project of failed failed mercantile empires to reestablish a large zone of economic cooperation now on the continent. And what it takes from empire is that large economic zone. Where it's different from empire is the predominance of the rule of law, indeed the exaggeration of the idea that our partners are, are equals. 
That's the magic of Europe, and it's something that Europeans tend entirely to take for granted. The European Union of 2018 is the peace settlement of the First World War. The First World War tried to establish nation states on the basis of failed empires. This failed in Europe completely. Um, this means that the historical stakes of how Europe does in 2018 tend to, be high, tend to be higher, I think, than Europeans themselves realize. The European conversation tends to be about some version of Europe versus some version of the nation state. But since the nation state never actually happened in European history, not for the Dutch, not for the French, um, not very briefly for the Irish, the Swedish are more of an exception, but in general there is no nation state to go back to. Above all, there's no British nation state to go back to. So there is no historical choice between nation state and Europe. The historical choice was between empire and Europe, and one likes to think that that choice has already been made. So I, my, my own broad position is that Europeans should understand that what they've done is create a political novelty, something entirely new. And whatever its relationship is to the state, what it's done has been to enable the state, to enable the European state, to make it possible, because the nation state in the old style hasn't proven to be possible in Europe. Now, from my point of view then as a historian, what I worry about is that each year that we go away from 1918, each year that we go away from history, each year that the talk of Europe is always about the next new thing, is another year where young Europeans grow further away from understanding what the project is already about. The big gap in European integration is history. There is no European history as such. And I, I tend to think that has a great deal to do with the fact of the, of the alienation of younger people from Europe. There's no European younger generation encounter with Europe as, as such. And, and what makes this worry greater for me is that I know that there will never be a year of history, right? There can be a year of blockchain. At, at Davos this year, everyone has to say blockchain at every panel, so I've just done it. <laughs> there, there, can, there can be a year of blockchain. Add disruption but, or... But there will, never, there will never be a year when we say there has to be history. But I, I tend to think actually that's, that's the missing piece, that that's the missing piece. Well, thank you. The thing is with the, we don't have a European public opinion and we don't have, we only have national public opinions. And so I think this is also something which is lacking. But keep this aside for the moment and, and look at, at France and Germany because um, we have a President uh, Macron, he's very active. Um, and we are, we are hoping for a government in Germany. I'm hoping too. I mean, it's nicer to have a government you can criticize as journalists but, uh, <laughs> than to have none. Um, so when, when these both get in, on track, which we hope, then we'll have another probably well-meant Franco-German attempt. And normally, everybody's in Europe saying we have to have this motor, this Franco-German motor. If it's not going, people complaining. When it's going, they say, well, they shouldn't dominate us. So what is your feeling as, let's say, coming from countries which are not as big as France, for instance? So, um, do you see the fear of domination, or is there a good interaction on, on what track is going to be? So, Mark. Well, in Europe, we have the freedom to meet and to come together. So also, the French president and the German chancellor have the freedom to sit together and to take decisions. There is no problem with that. Uh, and we all have our meetings and our ways of uh, getting this whole thing uh, going. The question, of course, is what is a sort of common agenda on which we will try to agree in the coming years? And I very much hope that there will be an agenda to, first of all, uh, complete the single market. We still can add twice the size of the Dutch economy to the European economy. That's almost, that's more than the size of the Spanish economy, 1.4, 1.5 trillion euros by implementing the digital single market, implementing everything which is there in the services directives, everything which is there in the capitals union and in the energy union. And that's crucial. Four million jobs. At the moment, we are not doing that. The internal market is only there for goods. Only 30% of the European economy is part of the internal market. So th this thing is failing us at the moment. So there's a huge opportunity there. Secondly, uh, I 
think we have to f focus on the question, how can we stimulate countries to, to take the necessary steps for reforms? There is this talk about, about shock absorption. The Netherlands has a debt uh, south of 60%. So we can, if necessary, I don't hope it will happen, I don't expect it will happen. But if there would be an asymmetric shock, we could go to the market and borrow 20% or 30% of GDP, which is about 200 billion, to save the banks or whatever is happening in such a scenario. Um, and I think each of the 19 countries in the Eurozone needs this capacity to do this, do this on their own, to be able to go to the market and say, we, country X, Y or Z, we need to do this. We can only do that if everybody has put in place all the necessary measures. Also, when the sun is shining today, when the economy is doing very well, has put in place the necessary reforms. So we have to discuss how can we stimulate countries to do this. One of the ways is uh, to make sure that your cohesion funds and all the payments in the common agricultural policy, etc., are dependent on the question whether you have implemented the country-specific recommendations from the Commission, that you have really done what is necessary. Uh, and by doing that, you stimulate countries to reform. Uh, that's crucial. So whatever the axis between France and Germany, or we are working together now with the, with the Benelux and the Baltics and the Scandics to keep this voice of free trade, uh, this voice of the internal market, to keep that alive when the UK is leaving us, uh, whatever the sort of country sitting together, I, I very much will plead for an agenda which is focused on free trade, completion of the single market and uh, uh, encouraging, almost forcing all the countries to do what is necessary within the stability and growth pact. So there is no fear on the panel that the Franco-German, whatever axis or whatever you call it, um, better working together will leave you behind, for instance? I suppose I'd make um, I suppose I'd make three very brief points. Um, the first is that those of us who believe in Europe and believe that Europe on balance is a good thing for all of our countries uh, can only welcome uh, France and Germany cooperating, becoming an engine for uh, further development in Europe. And Europe at its best was that period when Mitterrand was president in France and Kohl was president in Germany under the Delors Commission, driving forward things like the euro. Uh, like enlargement, like European citizenship, those things wouldn't have happened without that uh, Franco-German engine and that Franco-German alliance. So uh, it's something that I welcome, but I am also cautious about uh, because um, the Europe of the past, the historical Europe, if you like, was a Europe not just of empires, but Europe's of, a Europe of large states that went to war on occasion, uh, very often overran small states, uh, and on occasion would come together at various conferences, the big countries, decide what was best for Europe and would inform the small countries afterwards. And we definitely don't want to see that. We don't want to see um, you know, meetings in Paris and Berlin that only countries with more than 40 million people are invited to attend and the smaller countries being told afterwards what's good for Europe. Um, so the spirit that we need is very much one that I think was encapsulated by that great German foreign minister, Hans-Dietrich Genscher. And during that period, he said that every day he would ask himself the question, uh, what do the small countries think? And if Germany, in particular, and France as well, operate on that basis, I think that engine, um, can, I think we can be in that car, to put it that way, uh, of that, um, uh, with that engine in it. Uh, but if they don't, then I think uh, difficulties will arise. Um, finally, the departure of the United Kingdom does change things. It is going to be a different Europe uh, without the United Kingdom there, a country that uh, was, was very much part of the, the free market, the free trade lobby. Um, they, they currently wish to lead the single market, but in many ways they were the architects uh, of the single market uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and that's why uh, those countries who are free traders, free enterprise, uh, believe in low taxation, uh, generally speaking, uh, will need to work together and build new alliances. And that involves countries like Ireland, the Benelux countries, Nordics, Baltics, uh, also some of the states of Central Europe that actually um, are very pro enterprise as well, and some of the Mediterranean countries. So it is going to change that paradynamic, but it's up to us to influence it. Cecile, what is going to change in this new Europe without Britain in the balance? Well, first of all, it's going to be more boring. <laughs> 
because we, we enjoy the, the, well, the you wit. You thought it was boring the, the last. <laughs> yes, because uh, the Brits have a specific yeah. sense. No, no offense to the rest of you. <laughs> You're also very funny. But, but uh, the, the special wit and the special sense of humor that the Brits have brought to the European Union, I am going to miss it. And many uh, others. And then, of course, uh, as the Prime Minister of Ireland said, I mean, they have been the driving forces about what we need now to, to really fully recover from the economic crisis, the internal market, services, uh, free trade, openness, the transatlantic uh, relation. Um, they, they also very active lately on, on, uh, on environmental issues and, and, and so on. So we are going to miss them. We'll have to handle it. We will. We'll find a way. Um, so it will be a different union. But that's why we need now to focus on you know, getting these common projects going. We need to make sure that Europe can add value when it comes to security, the fight against terrorism, the inequalities, the youth uh, employment, unemployment that is still there, the uh, environmental climate challenges that, that, that we, we have there. And that I think we need to focus on, on these things so that people can see in their daily life that Europe is delivering. And of course, we need to discuss for the future, how should Europe work? Should we change the way we are making decisions? But I wouldn't go into a big institutional reform now. Let's make sure that we work and that we consolidate and that we can show our citizens that Europe is working, that we are delivering. Re Trust has actually increased in the European Union. We thought that it would go down. It was a lot of, of anxiety. But after Brexit, trust in the European Union among the citizens went up in basically all countries. That's a good thing. But let's preserve it. Let's show that we, 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 we deserve it. Sure. If you look around at the rest of the world, it's not always convincing what hap is happening over there. So maybe this Indeed. is a chance for Europe, too. Uh, Antonio, do you think that aust austerity politics will have an end? Or will it continue in the next years to come in Europe? I think that in this crisis, uh, which has uh, affected the different countries differently, and different countries have come up with different uh, solutions to face up to those difficulties. But over the last uh, couple of years, I think that we have understood uh, that uh, we have common objectives, but we've got to allow people to be free to have democratic uh, sovereignty and to see how they want to achieve a particular objective. Two years ago, when I was appointed uh, Prime uh, Minister, Mark was uh, uh, in the seat of the presidency, and uh, the idea was uh, to reduce the deficit, uh, to reduce the debt, and uh, we were called upon uh, to meet our commitments to the European Union. But fortunately, we are uh, now out of this uh, deficit reduction program. We have a deficit of about 1.2% uh, of the city. I think we've paid the last installment yesterday of uh, the uh, uh, loan uh, with uh, an additional bonus uh, to the IMF. I think that we need to turn the page now of austerity, and we need to, to change our policies. But let me just come back to your earlier question. That is to say, uh, the question about uh, France and Germany being the motor. There are two aspects to this. I think it is clear that today there is a new energy that has uh, been uh, unleashed uh, to drive things forward in Europe. And I think that that is a reaction to Brexit. I think that uh, Europe of 27 have united, have come together to make an effort to, to find solutions in order to get Europe moving forward. And I think that the Commission has played a very important role in this uh, with the white paper which was presented, with uh, the State of the Union which uh, uh, Mr. Juncker presented to, to the European Parliament, and now with the election of President Macron, uh, European is moving forward much more than it was in the past, but we have to continue. We mustn't stop there. I think that this energy is very important. Today, Europe is not what it was at uh, the time of coal and Mitterrand. It's more diversified. And I don't think it's not enough to have an agreement between France and Germany to have uh, uh, an agreement uh, between the 27. The second point, are we a 
afraid that somebody might be sidelined. I think that we need to learn lessons of Brexit. I think that one of the important lessons of Brexit is that we have to respect uh, the decision of peoples, and you've got to leave countries a certain margin of maneuver. What does this mean? If we can move forward at the same pace in the Europe of 27, that's best. But if we cannot move forward as a Union of 27 at the same time, then I have uh, no reason uh, to say why not have a different speed uh, for Europe, provided that everything is open to the people who want to participate. And there's nothing new to that. Look at Schengen. It's already uh, a multi-speed uh, system. The euro is also uh, in a similar situation. Victor Orban sometimes uh, says, uh, with his uh, normal frankness, uh, that uh, there is uh, one thing uh, uh, that... Uh, I, you must enforce me to follow if you go down a particular path. So should we stop just to, to respect uh, Mr. Orban's uh, desires, or should we also say we have to respect our own uh, decision to go faster in a group of countries? Now, and I think uh, we need to... ...to my next question, because mentioning Orban means also that we haven't talked about the, let's say, Middle and Eastern European EU members. And, uh, Timothy, um, sometimes we have the feeling they see in Europe and the European Union another project than the people sitting here around, or President mm -hmm. Macron. And uh, could, you, could you briefly tell us why this is so, and uh, why there is so much, well, division for the moment between, in some certain points, especially the refugee crisis, between uh, the Middle European Eastern countries and, and the rest of the EU? So it, you, you put me in a difficult position, because one, one of the things which is striking about this conversation, and, and not only this conversation, is, is the absence of member of representatives of those member states. And I, I can't, of course, as an American historian, adequately represent their position. I, I can only make a couple of remarks. One of them is that I'm, as an observer, I'm deeply concerned that Poland doesn't understand the stakes of a two-speed Europe. I, I, I'm not sure whose job it is to make that explanation clear. But from, from reading the Polish press and listening to representatives of the Polish government, I'm not sure they realize, at least as I see it, what a disaster a two-speed Europe would be for them. I'm not sure those consequences have been spelled out. Now, looking at Europe from their point of view, I have to first introduce a qualification. Poland is a deeply divided society, much like the United States. Sometimes elections go one way, sometimes they go another. There are many people in Poland who are deeply attached to the European Union. So we have to be very careful when a government changes not to dismiss an entire society. How does this government see it? This government sees the European Union um, as Germany. I simplify because I'm allowed to because I'm not a diplomat. They see the European Union, they associate the European Union with Germany, and they associate Germany with the traditional historical threat to their sovereignty. The, political, the particular political tradition which is in power in Poland now is more obsessed with Germany than, than with Russia. So they look at the European Union, their skepticism about the European Union has to do with questions of sovereignty. I think they have it exactly backwards. I think the European Union rescues the European state rather than threatening it. I think if you're a fragment of a European land empire like Poland, the way to preserve your proud national traditions is to combine them with a large market with the rule of law like the European Union. But that's, that's how they see it. They see it in terms of, as the Prime Minister mentioned, they see it in terms of a history in which larger countries seek to dominate smaller countries. I think they're making a mistake. I think they're, they're taking a gamble they don't fully understand, but that's how they see it. Well, Timothy, thank you very much. We have uh, also questions on Twitter, I said, and I would just get one in. Um, it's coming from Peter Komornik, and he asks uh, the question, how can Europe claim a global role when it's so focused on its internal issues? Smart question. So who wants to answer? 
Okay, Timothy, you're, you're the fastest. <laughs> who, who are the other candidates, right? I mean, it's, it's faute de mieux, faute de mieux, especially in the range of values. The, the, the Chinese are determined not to associate universal values with their projects. The Americans are determined to distance themselves, at least for the time being, from what had been our universalist values. I, I think that this is Europe's chance. That it's not as though there's someone else out there who is seeking to project universal values. It's a chance also in the sense of European power projection. This is what you can do at the moment that no one else can do. And to push the point even further, it's actually rather important for the United States of America that you do it. Um, I might say, I, I, yeah. I, think, I think there are two ways. Um, the, the first is trade at a time when um, the United States is stepping back from uh, free trade agreements, um, at a time when the United Kingdom is leaving uh, the largest trading bloc in, in the world. And uh, we have an opportunity to connect to other parts of the world through our trade agreements. And we've done that already very successfully with Canada, uh, with CETA, um, good agreements in place with them. Um, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of doing your job for you. I'm praising you here, by the way. Uh, and also, of course, um, of course uh, uh, Japan and, and, and South Korea. And um, if we can get it right with, with Mercosur, depending on one various sensitivities there, of course, uh, I think that's the way we can actually um, project our power as Europe, but also also bring, bring good things to the world. Um, and the second, uh, I believe, is very much through our commitment to international development, where we as Europeans uh, could and should do an awful lot more. And one of the ideas that people talk about a lot is the idea of a Marshall Plan for Africa. And after the devastation of the Second World War, uh, America made sure that Western Europe was rebuilt. Uh, and it's in our interests, I believe, for us to come together as Europeans and try to do something similar for Africa. We've already seen the consequences uh, of Libya failing as a state. A small country, four million people, medium to high income. And when it failed as a state, there were enormous humanitarian consequences for people in Libya and a very negative effect on Europe. And if much larger African states were to go the wrong way, imagine the humanitarian crisis and imagine the impact on Europe. So it's very much in our interest to make sure that Africa succeeds in the 21st century, that it becomes politically stable, and that over the next decades, a bit like China and East Asia, their economies become ones that we want to uh, trade with rather than send aid to. But we have responsibility to make that happen. Uh, and, and I think those are the two areas where Europe could show real leadership in the world. Short. Yeah, it's very, very short to build on what Leo is saying. It, it, it all depends on the issue. In many cases, it will be the individual member states uh, who will conduct the foreign policy of their nation. But on other occasions, like the free trade agreements, like what is now happening with Africa to take out the root causes of migration as part of a step-by-step -step approach to control the migratory flows, take the, uh, what we did with Turkey. Uh, at the height of the Syrian refugee crisis. It took four days from the south of Turkey to get into Berlin or Amsterdam. Uh, and then in February, March, we were able, with Turkey, to come to conclusions together, a deal which basically uh, secured um, uh, reception capacity in Turkey uh, for the Syrian refugees and therefore being able to control that migratory flow. And that was something we did as a collective, as a European Union. So it depends on the issues. Uh, but the Iran issue is uh, an example. The Iran issue, Iran issue Europe is a very surely good has example. showed the leadership to, to preserve the agreement. And there was Frederica Mogherini in a, in, a, in a leading role. So I, th I think this is good. And the old saying of Kissinger, I want to have one phone number, whom to call in the European Union. And now I, in his days he had six, now he, he would have 28. Well, it, it will depend on the issue. I think the other one, if I, if I may, may intervene again, is, is our own neighborhood uh, in terms of enlargement. Uh, we have in the Western Balkans, uh, Albania, Serbia, uh, Montenegro, Macedonia, a number of countries um, which, which, which could become destabilized. Uh, and the best way that we can uh, look after our own neighborhood, like the Western Balkans, is to assure them that there is a pathway towards, uh, towards membership. Um, enlargement hasn't finished. Uh, yes, and that's one of the areas where I think uh, we can actually do the right thing as Europeans. Yes, I think, I mean, um, as a DG of Deutsche Welle with this Germany's global broadcaster, I can assure you, and you know it yourself, that the European model is quite attractive for a lot of people around this world. So one should maybe not be too 
sure. critical about them your, oneself, but also see, see the attractiveness of, of the model and, and the rule of law and all these kind of things. But um, now we have also uh, another guest uh, here, in, uh, in not on this panel, not a surprise guest. He's not, not arrived yet, so, so just cool down. So um, um, the US president has landed in Davos, and everybody's a bit excited uh, for different reasons, I presume. And um, um, tomorrow he will be on this stage, exactly here. He will hold his speech um, uh, to, to, to all of us here in Davos. And uh, um, now to all of you, if you have one wish to have one idea to write down in his speech for tomorrow, what would this be? That he, Mark, you start. Well, that he will acknowledge that for the United States, being the leader of the free world, being uh, the biggest economy in the world by far, that it is crucial to maintain the international legal order, to keep on investing in the UN, in NATO, uh, in the WTO, and that you cannot run the world in, on a bilateral basis. And um, I think we need to have that dialogue with, uh, with the American uh, president and to convince him of the necessity of the United States with its leadership cap capacity and capability to keep on investing in this international legal order. It is crucial. Uh, for the Netherlands, we are one of the three most internationally connected countries in the world. We are, in absolute terms, the fifth biggest exporter. And for many other countries in the European Union and all over the world, it is crucial to maintain that order. And, and we need the US as a champion. Leo, what would be your thought for this speech? Oh, I, I wish I wish I could write that one, but um, I don't think I'm going to don't be given that offer. But um, to give to give you a hypothetical answer to a hypothetical question is actually very similar to Marx. Uh, it is perhaps an acknowledgement that what makes America great uh, is actually American values. Uh, this is a country um, that, by and large, has been a force for good in the world down the centuries. It's a country that made itself great. Uh, by trading with the world. It's a country that made itself great by accepting migrants from all over the world, mm. uh, including from, from my country, took the best brains and the hardest working people from all over the world, mm. uh, and they built America. Uh, and also it's a country that, by being involved in the world, uh, saved the world from fascism yes. uh, and then from communism thereafter. And when America disengages from the world, um, when it doesn't live up to those very American values, uh, the world becomes a more dangerous place uh, and a lesser place. Antonio. Well, I think being an advisor to Mr. Trump is probably a very high-risk uh, task. <laughs> no, let me just uh, say that the European Union has to understand uh, that there is a new framework that under the new administration things have changed. And there is a big opportunity for the European Union, particularly in the field of free trade. We can take a, a leading role. And I think it's up to the European Union to maintain those values which have made so many millions of people around the world to dream about freedom, respect of the dignity of human beings, the freedom to have a free trade, a rule of law, all those values are the values of the European Union. And I think we need to spread those values. So the European Union cannot afford to waste time. Uh, for example, in uh, the negotiation with Mercosur. That is a key negotiation for transatlantic uh, relations because on the other side of the Atlantic, it's not just the United States, it's not just Canada, uh, Central America, South America, and uh, I think that Mercosur is uh, an essential uh, negotiation. It is 10 times more important than one uh, we've done with CETA. So, Mr. Mastrom, please hold uh, to your line and try and negotiate an agreement with uh, Mercosur as quickly as possible and with our partners on the other side. Uh, the so, the, the birth, no? mm? <laughs> so, Cecilia, you had now time to think about the whole speech with Mr. Trump to write it down. So, what would be your thought? Well, I've, I've actually rewrote it in my head. I have, would have lots of messages uh, uh, that, that I hope that the president would say. But uh, yeah, the fact that he's coming here is a signal. It's always better that you talk 
with each other than about each other. Now he has managed for the whole Davos to talk about him. Now let's see if we can talk with him as well. Um, but but I, I fully agree. I hope he comes with the message that the US wants to engage with the world, that a strong, stronger America is is crucial to have a stronger world, and, and we can only be strong together. So multilateralism, international organizations, I hope he will announce that he was only joking when he annulled America's participation to the, the climate agreement in Paris. Uh, and I hope that, that, that he will engage with us in, in, uh, in building a better world, because there are issues that he brings up that where we can share his criticism against others and so on. We are well, willing to work with him, but it has to be within the established order of the multilateral global rules that we together have agreed, where they have taken a lead. All these institutions that we talk about, America founded them, and it has been good for the US. So I hope he comes here with the message of, of engagement. Uh, whether that happens or not, I, I don't know. And then I would have a lot of internal messages, we know but tomorrow. I leave that for the, for the so, uh, um, American audience. Timothy, before I give you the last word, which is, I think, the great. So, position of power. And I would ask you in the, in the, in the, um, in the room if you have uh, two questions. I would take two questions if, if you want. Okay, I see one over there. And um, please introduce yourself. And a good question is not longer than 20 seconds. <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Howard. I'm a, a Brexit refugee living in the Netherlands um, <laughs> and desperately trying to hang on to a sense of humor. Commissioner, uh, is it possible that our friends in Europe can actually offer a choice to Britain to come to stay in with a twin track Europe? David Cameron failed to negotiate any sort of outcome, but I think just a small olive branch might tempt people over the line. Okay, who wants to answer? Well, I think Cameron negotiated an excellent package. Uh, and even the Eastern European countries were, were able, after some considerable pressure, to accept it, including an emergency break on, uh, on people moving from the Eastern part of the European Union into the Western part of the European Union at the Commission level. And I think it was an excellent result. Um, and the debate went very well in the UK as long as it was about the economy. But as soon as the debate shifted to other issues, like values and, and sovereignty and migration, the thing uh, started to uh, collapse with the result uh, we have seen. What now is necessary is for Theresa May to decide what she wants. We cannot have a situation in which we have to decide for her what the future relationship with the European Union will be. She has to decide, and she knows that single market means free movement of people. Customs union or other arrangements means certain obligations. And, and yes, if, if the UK is not willing to do anything, you will end up in a free trade agreement. And what I desperately hope, of course, is that they will at least partly come back to the decision and be able to somehow stay connected to the internal market and the customs union. Okay, so I think this, was, this is it. And um, Tim, your last thought towards our discussion and maybe also what you would write into the speech of your president. That's, that's more intimacy than I would wish. Um, so the, with, with Europe, my, my one thought, my concluding thought is the mechanisms of European identity have been the idea that economics leads to politics, leads to economics, leads to politics. That's true to an extent. The second mechanism of European identity was we will remember the war. That is wearing itself out. When I think of institutional renewal in Europe, I think first of all of institutions that would allow the young of Europe to have a moment of encounter with Europe um, while they are young to make it meaningful for them, some passage through Europe. I think that's very important. When it comes to Mr. Trump, I will spin this a slightly different direction, not being European and not being a diplomat or a politician. Um, Mr. Trump is a very skilled entertainer. At the end of the day, he has an audience of one. Everyone else is a moving prop in his production. It's very important not to get yourselves too involved in his story, whether that's as a way to motivate yourselves to do good things, or whether it's as a, a hope that he will come around. Just don't get involved in the story. His audience, in the end, is only himself. It's very kind to hear these 
these words of praise about the United States of America, they apply to a country which has 50 states, numerous cities, countless non-governmental organizations, 300 million citizens, and all kinds of ways to engage. The United States will need European engagement. We will need it in much the way Europe has needed our engagement in the past. So this is it.